that. And so we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this really important conversation on threats to uh, religious freedom in Cuba and Nicaragua. And my name is Theo Baboon, and I am the president and CEO of Outreach Aid to the Americas. Uh, first, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items uh, to make the virtual conference and your time as productive as possible. Please submit your questions in the chat box. There's a chat box, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, specify who the question is for, and we will choose some of these, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. And we will do a Q&A at the end of the, uh, of the presentations. Also, for the best sound quality, we will control the speakers. Uh, we ask you to please uh, mute your speaker um, uh, and, uh, or the host will do it for you uh, to keep the noise down and we, can, uh, and we can keep the quality as high as possible. Uh, the starting point of this conversation is the placing of Cuba and Nicaragua in the ranks of the world's most worst violators of religious freedom by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. In his 2020 annual report, which was published just a few weeks ago. In this report, USERF recommends that the State Department keeps Cuba and Nicaragua on its special watch list. These are the countries where the government engages in or tolerates severe violations of religious freedom. The representatives of USERF will expand uh, and explain. Uh, this point a little later. Uh, we must continue to talk about and bring attention to these violations of religious freedom in our region, a, uh, a, a foundational human right, because although so much of the world is on a pause because of the coronavirus crisis, these abuses continue and in some cases are getting worse as incompetent and cowardly leaders lash out our religious communities who are stepping up and leading in a time of great need and uncertainty. In fact, uh, civil rights defenders states that 96% of Cubans surveyed are reporting an increase in human rights violation during the pandemic. Religious leaders and other Good Samaritans are being jailed simply for assisting elders and providing mutual aid to neighbors, and church leaders are being detained and charged for spreading epidemics and illicit enrichment ostensibly related to church activities that are taking place uh, mostly in, in Cuba. But let's hear from the experts on this and other points, uh, if you will. Let's get uh, let's get the show on the road. And uh, so uh, first, uh, we're thrilled to be joined by USERV's staff members, Kristen Laverty and Zach Udin. Uh, Kristen is an international legal specialist at USERV, where she monitors Cuba before, uh, before joining USERV. She worked providing legal and policy assistance to civil society representatives in difficult political environments. She has used her international law experience to write various publications for USERV uh, on issues such as blasphemy law and anti-extremism law that are used to restrict religious freedom. And SAC is a researcher and analysis of USERV. In addition to monitoring religious freedom issues in various countries in Latin America, he also works on cross-cutting projects such as USERV's new database of victims of religious freedom violations and global anti-Semitism. Zach is, uh, will be sharing about USERV's reporting and recommendations on Nicaragua. So let's get going with Kristen. Please, Kristen, first uh, let us hear from you about uh, Cuba. Thank you, um, and thank you, Teo, and to OAA for convening this really important meeting and the opportunity to highlight religious freedom conditions in Latin America. Uh, before I get started, I see that we have Commissioner Manchin, and I think Commissioner Bergava might be on or trying to join. 
Um, so if either of you want to make any introductory remarks before I start, please feel free. No, please go ahead. We're excited to hear from you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the International Legal Specialist at um, USERF, and together with Zach, uh, we monitor uh, Latin America on behalf of the Commission. So to start, I will um, briefly just introduce USERF for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with our work and explain specifically what our um, mandate and uh, standards we use in our reporting. Uh, before explaining some of our policy recommendations that were contained in our 2020 annual report um, before turning it over to Zach. We have a bunch of Cuban experts um, and Nicaraguan experts as well and religious leaders that will be speaking and go um, in more detail about the country conditions, but we hope by framing the discussion in terms of the policy recommendations, uh, we can really think about what can be done to improve religious freedom conditions in both of these countries. Um, so first to start, uh, USERF is a bipartisan uh, federal agency that monitors and reports on religious freedom and provides policy recommendations to the U.S. government. We were uh, created under the International Religious Freedom Act that was passed in 1998, uh, and we have nine, two, uh, nine bipartisan uh, commissioners, uh, two of which are with us today, um, that are appointed by both political parties. An important piece of our work is that we use international human rights standards in monitoring the religious freedom conditions. Um, so as mentioned by Teo, our 2020 annual report uh, was released last month and it details religious freedom conditions in 2019. Some of you might be aware um, or familiar with the State Department's religious freedom report, which uh, includes all countries in the world. In contrast, our report focuses solely on the worst of the worst. And so this year, um, we reported on 29 countries, including Cuba, uh, which was in our annual report for the 17th consecutive, consecutive year, and Nicaragua, which appeared for the very first time. For both countries, we recommend that the State Department um, again place them on their, its special watch list. And so the special watch list is a new designation that was created by the Frank Wolf Amendments to IRFA uh, in 2016 for countries that engage in or tolerate severe religious freedom violations, as Teo mentioned. And so that's defined uh, in the law as uh, violations that are on two of the three of ongoing, systematic, and or egregious. When the countries engage in or tolerate violations that are all systematic, ongoing, and egregious, um, those countries are to be designated countries of particular concern, or CPCs. Um, and so in recognition of the severe religious freedom violations that occurred in 2018, the State Department uh, placed both Cuba and Nicaragua on its special watch list for the very first time last December. And so we recommend in our report um, that this designation be repeated. Um, so as I mentioned, I'd just like to highlight uh, three key policy recommendations we have for the U.S. government. The first being, as I mentioned, that uh, Cuba should again be placed on the special watch list. Um, to justify this recommendation, we explain in our report how the Cuban government uses a, res a restrictive system of laws and policy surveillance and harassment to control religious groups and suppress the freedom of religion or belief on the island which we'll go into more depth here today. We also suggest that the US government impose targeted sanctions, uh, which can include both financial um, sanctions and visa bans on the government agencies and officials that are responsible for severe violations of religious freedom, uh, specifically naming um, the head of the Office of Religious Affairs. Uh, the Office of Religious Affairs um, is an entity that USERF has for uh, a long time expressed concern over that it tightly controls religious activity on the island. Uh, particularly concerning is that the OAR uh, requires religious groups to register and membership in an unregistered religious group is a crime. Uh, the last recommendation I'd like to highlight is that we call um, on the US government to ensure that the programming uh, that supports independent journalism uh, is responsive to uh, increased harassment that we've seen and we'll be discussing here today 
as a result um, that journalists are uh, experiencing as a result of reporting on religious freedom conditions. Um, so I greatly look forward to the discussion here today and would be happy to answer any questions after the other panelists. Uh, and I turn it over to Zach to speak about Nicaragua. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, hello, everyone tuning in, and thank you to OAA for inviting me to speak on behalf of USURF. My name is Zach. I'm a researcher here at USURF where I devote a portion of my responsibilities to monitoring religious freedom conditions in Nicaragua. Um, so as mentioned, this is the first year USURF included Nicaragua on, in its annual report. After the 2018 protests, the Catholic Church provided aid and sanctuary to protesters, condemned excessive government force, and attempted to mediate a national dialogue between the government and the protesters. But as a result, the Ortega government and its proxies began a systematic harassment campaign against the church and its followers, including intimidation and harassment of worshipers and religious leaders, and the violent targeting of churches. So these, con these abuses continued in 2019, which is why USURF decided to include Nicaragua in the annual report this year. Um, there was harassment of clergy, including defamatory accusations, arbitrary arrests, death threats on social media, and violent attacks. There, were, uh, there was damages to churches, where on many occasions, um, supporters of the regime besieged, desecrated, assaulted, and threatened churches. Um, oftentimes, police would be standing nearby while mobs attacked churches and worshipers, and they would do nothing. Um, and finally, there was intimidation and inability to worship. Uh, Pro-Ortega forces sought to instill fear in Catholic clergy and devotees by maintaining a threatening uh, presence near churches. Um, security forces would surround churches during mass and in some cases would film those entering and exiting the building. Um, and also there were reports of customs officers withholding containers of uh, donated goods, which included sacramental wine. Um, USURF had four specific policy recommendations related to Nicaragua in the annual report. Uh, the first is for the Department of State to maintain Nicaragua on its special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe violations of religious freedom. The second um, is to impose targeted sanctions on Nicaraguan government agencies and officials, including freezing assets and barring their entry into the United States. Um, the third would be to include, uh, encourage key countries, particularly those in Latin America, to ensure that violations of freedom of religion or belief are part of all multilateral or bilateral discussions with or about Nicaragua. And the third is that the US Congress should support House Resolution 754, um, expressing support of the people of Nicaragua in their quest for democracy and rule of law. Now that House resolution was already passed back in March, but there's been a new development where uh, recently last week, the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations passed Senate Resolution 525 which was introduced by Senators Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Bob Menendez, um, which is a resolution expressing support to Nicaraguans in their peaceful efforts to promote the restoration of democracy and the defense of human rights, and to use tools under US law to increase pressure on the Ortega regime. Um, now, USURF will continue to monitor the situation in Nicaragua in 2020, and we'll continue to advocate for implementation of these recommendations with our partners in the administration and in Congress. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kristen and Zach, and uh, welcome, uh, a special recognition to Commissioners uh, Bargava and uh, Manchin and uh, Executive Director uh, Eric uh, Singh in Suk and forgive me for the pronunciation, um, but uh, we welcome you to uh, the conference. Allow me to add one last uh, uh, adder uh, to your presentation uh, on Cuba, and that is a sister report that was published uh, just uh, a few months ago, the 2019 report of UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion, Dr. Ahmed, Ahmed uh, Shahid, we observe that Cuba's penal code allows imprisonment of people whose religious belief conflicts with the nation's socialist principles related to education, labor, defense, and 
the reverence of symbols. Terrible. Uh, our next speaker, um, uh, uh, trying to stay with Nicaragua uh, first, uh, just to follow up on uh, Sack's presentation, um, is Irela Guevara. Uh, she's an OAA program director. Ms. Guevara has 10 years experience working in the area of civil society development and political party strengthening as part of the National Democratic Institute uh, field office in Nicaragua. Uh, she was born and raised in Nicaragua and uh, left uh, in 2018 as part of the uh, persecution of the Catholic Church in Managua. She was an active youth uh, in youth ministry and youth ministry uh, coordinator uh, for the Catholic Church in Nicaragua. Today she will present the video of Bishop Carlos Aviles Canton, uh, the Vicar uh, General of the Archdiocese of Managua, and brief us on the highlights, facts, and events as proof of violations of religious freedom in Nicaragua. Irela, can, may we hear from you? Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Well, we just heard from our colleagues some of the social and political context uh, in Nicaragua. But to say in other words, um, April 2018 is for, the, for Nicaragua the biggest uprising since the Civil War ended in 1990. Faced with the presidential couple of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo that controls every branch of the government and the news media, young people across all the nation carry out their own version of an Arab Spring. The protest started as a narrow issue, changes to the social security system, but they quickly rose to a national boil when students began to die. The crackdown, the crackdown left more than 300 dead, over 2,000 injured, and more than 1,200 people arbitrarily arrested, some of them charged with serious crime, including terrorism. Following the outbreak of anti-government protests, the Catholic Church offered support to protesters by providing shelters in churches and medical care. Consequently, Daniel Ortega's government, security forces and supporters started a campaign of intimidation, persecution and harassment against Catholic institutions, clergy and churchgoers. This has severely disrupted the ability of Catholic worship freely in Nicaragua and has led to clergymen having to flee out of country for the concern of their lives. Facing the crisis, the government invited the Catholic <coughs> Church to mediate a dialogue with the private sector, but the so-called <coughs> national dialogue was officially suspended due to the lack of democratic conditions as government sympathizers attacked prominent church figures. The purpose of the national dialogue um, the Catholic Church created a civic alliance for justice and democracy presided by Bishop Carlos Aviles, whose words we will listen in the following video. Irela, since we're having difficulty, you may want to read, uh, well, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, for, 
unfortunately, we cannot hear the whole video, but what happened in Nicaragua is that while churches leaders were trying to broker peace, Ortega accused and charged without presenting evidence that churches store weapons and bombs in their premises. As we heard, uh, well, we cannot hear, it, but, but the Catholic Church play, play an important role in the Nicaraguan human rights civil society movement by providing humanitarian aid and taking simple actions like using church bells to warn of any impending attacks by parliamentary groups and government supporters in many cities of the country. Um, that is why the government has labeled uh, the Catholic leaders, coup plotters and enemies of the regime. Church leaders and even bishops have been targeted as thought they were terrorists. Thousands of Nicaraguan marched on the streets of the capital supporting the Catholic Church after these accusations were made. On July 13, 2018, police led a 15-hour attack using high-caliber ammunition against the Divine Mercy Church in Managua, which provided refuge to approximately 200 students that the police forced out and were looking for medical assistance to injured students who had protested at a nearby public university campus. Literally, uh, nuns and citizens kneeled down to ask for mercy to stop the fire. The Divine Mercy Church front still it's still packed from hundreds of bullet impacts. A small chapel behind the main sanctuary sustained the heaviest fire shooting, but still two studying were killed that day. Mm. Uh, government uh, supporters physically assaulted senior Catholic church leadership, including the Papal Nuncio, while they were attempting to assist persons sheltered in church in Diriamba. Following in 2019, several priests had to go into exile due to the threats from government supporters, including death threats and assaults. Even Pope Francis called Managua Auxiliary Bishop Silvio Baez to Rome, following sustained harassment by the Nicaraguan government and its supporters since the start of the conflict. Mothers um, of people detained in the context of the crackdown began a hunger strike inside the Miguel Arcangel Church in Masaya to demand the release of their children and more than 130 other detainees. The national police surrounded the church later that day, threatening the mothers, blocking the church entrance and cutting off access of drinking water and electricity. The police also arrested and detained that day 13 activists that handed water to the mothers through the church windows. The strike in Masaya continued for over a week with mounting concerns for the health of those involved in the strike that were without access to medicine or medical supervision. Reverend Edwin Roman, who permitted the hunger strike, subsequently began, became imprisoned inside the church without food for over a week. Government supporters entered several Catholic churches during mass in many cities of the country, waving red and black ruling party flags and chanting terrorists, murders, among other epithets has been said by Bishop Carlos Aviles. Several Catholic leaders testified that Christian wardens also denied Catholic clergy access to political prisoners, preventing them from offering uh, religious sacraments such as communion and confessions to detainees. In 2020, the government of Nicaragua continued the campaign against the Catholic Church. Pro Ortega forces seek out to infuse fear in Catholic clergy and devotees by maintaining a threatening presence near churches. Nowadays, security forces surround the churches during mass and film those entering and exiting uh, church buildings. The Catholic Church is at the tip of despair in the fight of the restoration of democracy in Nicaragua. Even right now with the COVID-19 outbreak, Bishop Carlos Aviles informed us that the church initiative for prevention was blocked by government officials. You probably are making yourself the question, what about the evangelical church? Well, the Ortega Murillo family tactically turned their backs on the Catholic church and expanded their ties with evangelical leaders. Also, some protestant leaders spoke out against government-sponsored repression. Ortega and Murillo apparently felt that the evangelicals were logical allies. The fact that evangelical churches are in Nicaragua's fastest growing denomination was clearly a motive. There is a, an increasing tendency of the government to favor some churches over others, 
at its political convenience, dole out public funding to dampen criticism of its human rights abuses, and well as regulate um, religion through registration and visa process. Demonstrate, all of this demonstrate that religious freedom is under attack. With all that said, I would like to make a reference uh, to the Nicaraguan Constitution, which prohibits discrimination based on religion. It provides for freedom of belief, religion, and worship, and it states no one shall be obligated to by coercive measures to declare his or her ideology or beliefs. The constitution states there's no official religion. However, the law entrusts government control, community level action groups known as family committees that closely monitor neighborhoods and communities in order to inform the government if action against the regimes are taking place. Last year, as we heard uh, from Zach and Kirsten, um, my, uh, Vice President Mike Pence condemned the Ortega government crackdown on religious freedom on December 18, 2019. The State, De the State Department placed Nicaragua on its special um, watch list for severe violation, as we mentioned during this presentation. And ironically, Cuba and Nicaragua were placed on the list on the same day. Um, the presence of Cubans in Nicaragua has been more clearly linked since April 2018 to allegation of human rights abuses and torture, according to Pablo Cuevas, lawyer of the Permanent Commission on Human Rights. Many people testified on Minia that Nicaraguans have been assaulted and protested by people in uniform with Cuban accent, along with Ortega policemen in the streets protests or in detention centers. Um, the denunciations have been echoed by Luis Almagro, who denounced Cuba in December 2018 for exporting methods of repression to Venezuela and Nicaragua. In this context, uh, we found the reason why it's so important to have this conversation about Cuba and Nicaragua together. Thank you. Thank you, Irela, for an amazing account of what's going on in Nicaragua. The Catholic Church is definitely under direct attack by the Ortega regime, and uh, the world needs to hear about these uh, abuses uh, and need to hear about brave heroes like uh, Bishop Carlos Aviles, who, uh, who we know you're, uh, you're close to. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the link to the Cubans. And as, even as you link to the, to the Cubans, uh, we like to, uh, we're pleased to now join by the Latin America Officer for uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, CSW. Uh, which is a human rights advocacy organization based in the United Kingdom uh, that promotes uh, freedom of religion or belief for all. CSW has extensive experience reporting on and advocating for religious freedom in Cuba and in January of this year they released a very uh, thorough report on religious freedom uh, conditions in Cuba which I encourage everyone to read. So let's hear from London. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, CSW. Thank you very, very much for the introduction, Teo. Um, like many of you here, uh, CS, in, at CSW, our vision is for a world free from religious persecution, where everyone can practice um, a religion of their, their religion or their beliefs um, of their choice. So as the CSW Latin America Advocacy Officer, today I'll be here to speak to you about um, some of the trends in uh, for violations and repression that we have observed over the past year. I'll be talking mainly about some of our findings uh, from our 2019, uh, our, our report published this year, um, looking back on the 2019 um, violations and panorama of religious freedom in Cuba. And I'll also be speaking a little bit about some of the trends that we have seen uh, this year, take place this year as, as well. Um, so I, I thought it best to begin with a, an overview of uh, the, the situation as things stand. So in 2019, there were 260, we documented, we received, 260 cases of four violations in Cuba. Now this was up from 151 cases in 2018. So we've certainly seen uh, significant negative developments in um, 
the Forbes situation in Cuba. There's been an overall deterioration in religious freedom. Um, and the key piece I want to, um, to speak on today is uh, the constitutional process. Cuba um, ushered in a new constitution in uh, February 2019 last year. And I want us to look at that process and I'm going to explain how that process worked and how the, and the government's methods of repression, um, specifically um, against uh, religious leaders, especially in particular and religious groups, um, and to look at those and, and to look at how their tactics um, ha are targeted against religious groups and also how they've um, how violations have increased and pressure on religious groups has intensified. Um, so th throughout the constitutional process, religious groups um, were incredibly outspoken about the watering down of uh, constitutional protections for religious freedom. Um, in particular, um, the associated right of freedom of conscience, which was removed altogether um, from protections, constitutional protections for religious freedom in Cuba. Um, and as their outspokenness has increased, um, and as the uh, relig uh, religious groups and different denominations have come together to speak out against this, um, the government has dealt with this in a uh, swiftly and in a very heavy handed fashion. Um, and one of the key trends we've seen is with particularly outspoken religious leaders being placed under travel ban. And what's been most interesting about this is that this has been um, across the board with, with religious leaders who had previously enjoyed uh, relatively free and um, travel outside of the country have had their, um, have been regulado or um, put on a list where they are not allowed to leave the country. Um, religious leaders continue to complain about um, the authority granted to the Office of Religious Affairs, as was mentioned by Kristen um, uh, from Yusuf, that is one of the key, the primary, primary mechanism that the um, government of Cuba uses to um, police and control uh, religious groups on the island. And um, arbitrary detention as well against of religious leaders and um, for um, religious freedom defenders um, has also increased as well. Now, while we have seen some positive developments, um, as I had mentioned, religious groups have become more outspoken around the uh, constitutional process in voicing their opposition to the watering down of um, protections for religious freedom and um, for freedom of conscience. Um, we have even that has been um, a positive development was the was the establishment of an evangelical alliance, um, which brought together the seven largest um, the Protestant denominations on the island. But even as I speak, um, even as I go into more detail about that, we will see how um, this has been hampered by um, the tactics that the government of Cuba uses in terms of utilizing laws um, or decrees to undermine constitutional, nominal constitution, constitutional protections. And all of this is to say, the overall point is to make, is that the proposed changes um, to the constitution around freedom of religion or belief show that the government continues to view religious organizations on the island, especially religious leaders, as potentially dangerous and certainly to be controlled. Um, now, why is this important? In a in a country like Cuba, um, in the kind of political system under which Cuba operates. Um, religious groups hold an incredibly important and unique position. Um, civil society is severely repressed in Cuba, and the majority of, civil, uh, of officially recognized organizations are linked to the government. So when we have um, different religious groups across the island um, choosing to maintain um, uh, choosing to maintain neutrality and not come under control of the government. Um, this, of course, proves um, a threat um, to political power. So to go first, if we examine now, um, moving on to the legal framework of the Constitution, it was adopted in February 2019. Um, it sets up basic guarantees of um, for nominally and prohibits discrimination on the basis of freedom of religion or belief. Um, 
however, let us note, um, it is given that freedom of conscience freedom of conscience has now been separated um, from freedom of religion or belief um, in the article in the constitution enshrining religious freedom. Um, it is now illegal to invoke conscientious objection, um, quote unquote, with the intention of evading compliance with the law. Um, we look at Cuba's penal code. Um, this is another tactic the government uses. Um, its penal code um, is often used to limit rights laid out in the constitution to deliberately undermine the rule of law. So if we look at a clause like the abuse of freedom of worship clause in the penal code, where anyone can receive, be imprisoned for three months to a year um, who, um, for where their religious beliefs are placed in conflict with the aims of education, work duties, um, defending the nation in arms or revering its symbols or any other established stipulations in the constitution. Um, now, this particular, um, this particular clause is enshrined under a section of the penal code that addresses, um, that addresses crimes against public order. So what we now see um, is that a broad range of religious activities can now um, be penalized, have now been criminalized. Um, and these are activities which do not endanger public order. Other loosely defined, um, defined crimes, such as disobedience, disrespect, are also used and leveled against um, religious um, leaders um, on the island as well and used to target them. Let us also note, Cuba has signed up to, but not ratified, um, um, international governments protecting civil, political, economic, and social and cultural rights, which also con contain protections on FORB. So the point is that um, the point is that um, in multilateral for international fora, um, the government of Cuba will frequently say, um, "Yes, there is religious freedom on the island. Look, we have this constitution." However, it's important to note that this um, the this is nearly an image um, to project around the world, um, of, to project the image of the rule of law. In practice, the constitu these constitutional commitments are consistently undermined um, by the government governing by decree using criminal law as a tool of oppression. If we move on to looking at legal recognition, um, we, um, we see that once again, as I had mentioned, the Office of Religious Affairs um, operate which controls um, religious groups on the uh, island operates out of the Ministry of Justice but is actually in fact a part of the Central Committee of um, the Communist Party and so this means that all religious groups have to request permission from the ORA for things as small as um, repairs to, part, um, to arranging public um, events. And what we have seen across the island is that it is the key perpetrator of um, violations um, of religious freedom across uh, the island. Um, and in particular around the constitutional process when groups are becoming more outspoken um, on the watering down of um, protections for FORB and freedom of conscience, um, religious leaders were routinely summoned by the Office of Religious Affairs affairs um, across um, the different province provinces um, across the island to ask how their how their um, their congregations and their membership were going to vote in and put and they how they were going to vote and they were put and they put pressure on these leaders to ensure that they voted yes in line with the constitution so once again we see how this um, so-called uh, independent body that operates out of um, the, uh, the Central Committee of the Communist Party is used again to put pressure on leaders and um, religious leaders and their communities. Um, in the latter half of 2019, um, the Evangelical Alliance that was established to speak out against, um, uh, to speak out against the Constitution, um, the watering down of constitutional protections on FORB, um, when it put through its registration for um, its registration to the Office of Religious Affairs, um, for months it was um, they heard nothing from the office. And on the 31st of January, the leaders were summoned in and told that their request had been rejected um, because the Ministry of Justice did not have the competency to authorize um, or regulate religious associations. Um, however, the lawyers pointed out that there is a law that states that as long as um, there is no law regulating religious associa associations, i.e. no ley de culto, a law of worship, there isn't in Cuba. 
um, such matters fall to the Ministry of Justice to um, to um, oversee. So we can see again, once again, how um, how laws and administrative bodies are used to water down uh, religious freedom and circumscribe religious freedom in Cuba. So very quickly, um, as I know that we uh, are short on time um, and I'm wrapping up uh, the end of uh, my remarks, I'd like to talk a little bit about how harassment of religious leaders has increased. Um, uh, I had mentioned that religious leaders were subject to harassment and intimidation um, in the weeks leading up to the referendum and since post the referendum throughout 2019. Um, we can think of Pastor Alain Toledano, a leader of the fast growing apostolic movement, an unregistered group in Cuba, who was summoned 17 times between August and September. Um, which um, by uh, the authorities in Santiago, and this culminated in charges of criminal charges of disobedience being filed against him. Note, these, these charges have not been dropped. Um, we can speak about um, uh, independent um, former defender Ricardo Isaguirre, Fernandez Isaguirre, who um, through his work um, documenting violations with the ladies in white movement um, was also arbitrarily detained twice um, in July and November last year um, for four days incommunicado. Nobody knew where he was. And we would say that um, he was in fact released due to international pressure um, uh, and awareness being raised across social networks and advocacy, um, uh, behind the scenes advocacy networks. Um, and so all of this um, is, is to highlight that what some of the things that we have noticed um, in terms of rec recommendations is really keeping, um, raising public awareness around the situation in Cuba will be absolutely critical. And in terms of advocacy um, recommendations, um, CSW would urge uh, the ambassador of religious, um, Ambassador of Religious Freedom, Ambassador Brownback, and the Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom, um, Dr. Shahid, to request invitations to Cuba. Um, I would echo Yousef's recommendations that Cuba is also kept on the special watch list um, as, as well. Um, so um, that will be all for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, CSW, for really a comprehensive report. It's an honor for us to collaborate with you. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that many people know of the work of the Office of Religious Affairs. I think you did a, a great job of uh, uh, pointing that out. Um, I, was in, I was surprised and shocked really to learn as we were uh, just last week that oftentimes they even restrict the rights of prisoners to worship in some occasions as part of their intimidation tactics. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're getting uh, uh, short of time. There's so much to say. And we now want to hear from the advocates themselves. We want to introduce you to uh, Mario Felix. Uh, Pastor uh, Mario Felix uh, need no introduction to many of you. He, uh, uh, he served as a Baptist pastor in Cuba for many years um, and was a defender of religious freedom and human rights and continues to be, of course. Uh, he runs a blog now uh, on, the, on that issue. Uh, this made him a target uh, for, the, uh, for the regime and the Office of Religious Affairs detained him in a numerous locations and urged him and his family and his congregation as well as some friends urged him in 2016 to flee the country um, and seek asylum in the United States. So even though he no longer lives in Cuba, Pastor Mario Felix remains very active in his advocacy for religious freedom in Cuba, has a lot of connections uh, uh, in the, um, uh, with Cuba. And so we welcome Mario Felix. Uh, please talk to us and let us know what the advocates are saying. Thank you, Diateo. Um, send uh, others aids to the Americas. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, in effect, my name is Mario Felix Leonardo Barroso. Um, I, I am a Cuban a Baptist pastor. I served in Cuba for more than 15 years as a pastor and professor at a theological seminary. Uh, seven years ago, I was uh, one of the founders of the uh, Institute, uh, Pikemos Institute, 
and an interdenominational organization that promotes interreligious dialogue and promotes and monitors religious freedom. The Communist Party's Office of Religious Affairs was constantly interfered in our war inside the island, and state security agents were charged with monitoring me, learning me, and frequently detain me. Uh, look the pictures. Uh, as happened, for example, uh, on March 20, four years ago, the day uh, that President Barack Obama visited Cuba. Because uh, of the repression and tricks of in prison and death, the US, uh, USA government received me and my family as a refugees. Uh, if you look me, you look the, uh, my refugee document travel. Thanks, uh, United States, uh, for these new pilgrims. Um, thanks, God. Um, thanks for your prayers. Uh, during the almost four years that we, we have uh, been outside of Cuba, we have remained in contact with our brothers and sisters on the island, and we see as much as uh, possible as asylees to coordinate the activities of uh, Instituto Pagmos. My blog, Cubano Confesante, the blog of Instituto Pagmos, and our weekly podcast, that is here inside the island, are some public examples of uh, our work. Instituto Pagmos also publish annual reports about violations of religious freedom in Cuba, and also submit reports for the Universal Periodic Review of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The regime's tricks against us continue, even through, uh, so we no longer live on the island. Only two weeks ago, during a press conference, uh, no other than the Cuban foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla, issued a hate theory, defamatory attacks on pastors and church, uh, among uh, which uh, our names were mentioned <laughs> for Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla, uh, defamatory attacks. Uh, there are many violations inside the island, uh, as the annual report by Instituto Pagos uh, demonstrates. The, the case of Pastor Ramon Rigal and the Catholic layman uh, Roberto Quiñones, look the picture, Roberto Quiñones, are typical of believers that uh, the regime holds as prisoners despite important international demands for their liberation. Uh, just as it happened to me, believers of different religious groups are harassed constantly by the political system. Uh, I now have the honor of presenting a few uh, short videos of some of my brothers uh, in science, the Icelands. Uh, the first video are the, the father, uh, Castor uh, Jose Álvarez de Besa, uh, one Okay. Yes, uh, look the video. Is is a, a father Castor Jose Alvarez de Besa, uh, one of three signers of a letter uh, addressed to the dictator uh, Raúl Castro in January two years ago, containing strong criticisms of the situation in Cuba and outlining a piece of a path forward to improve conditions. He is currently the parish priest of a small church in the Modelo neighborhood of Camagüey province. And he is totally committed to rising to the challenge of these times that the Cuban uh, Catholic Church uh, is going uh, slow. Pastor Mario Felix, I'm gonna play the video. Okay, play the video. Limitaciones al no poder construir templos nuevos ni adquirir nuevas propiedades como personalidad jurídica. No podemos libremente educar a los niños, a la juventud cristiana en nuestra moral. Aparte del de desarrollo del pensamiento teológico que se limita a no tener la posibilidad de instituciones universitarias. En el aspecto de los medios de comunicación, pues también vemos una injusticia al haber un grupo que determina quiénes pueden hacer uso de determinadas materias, mientras que un grupo de la sociedad quisiera también aparecer 
por la radio, por la televisión, libremente expresando su fe. En las acciones caritativas también encontramos limitaciones para hacer, por ejemplo, centros asistenciales que pudieran ser para ancianos, para niños abandonados. También la libertad para eh, llegar a la inmensa población penal cubana. Nos vemos limitados a la hora de asistir a los presos. La Oficina de Asuntos Religiosos además aparece como aquella que detecta a aquellas personas o acciones de la Iglesia que pueden ser peligrosas para el Partido Comunista de Cuba, para su política dentro de la sociedad cubana. Ok, eh, los servicios, Padre Castor, eh, José Álvarez de Besa. Also, eh, giving eh, us eh, his testimony is Pastor Sandy Cancino, leader in the Evangelical League of Cuba in Havana, uh, who has endured tricks and is among the believers who are regulated in the last uh, year. Play the video. En ese sentido, hay que empezar a usar la misma constitución para hacerse respetar. En este sentido, que no siempre se, eh, por parte del gobierno se respeta ese criterio constitucional. Si sí vemos un problema con respecto a la libertad religiosa de nuestra nación. Y es que la iglesia, al formar parte activa de la sociedad cubana, eh, ellos necesitan los lugares que están abiertos, que puedan tener la oportunidad de producir su propio contenido y su propio criterio eh, para que otras personas lo conozcan, porque eso es cultura. Cuba ha limitado muchísimo el nuevo registro de nuevas denominaciones o de nuevos grupos religiosos. En los que quieren optar por el registro no quieren estar en una condición de ilegalidad. Son ilegales porque no le dan la oportunidad de registrarse simplemente con su credo. Y la iglesia nunca va a ser un peligro para la sociedad cubana, al contrario, va a ser un beneficio, va a traer eh, pureza, va a traer principios buenos para el desarrollo de, de nuestra sociedad. Ok, was uh, a pastor, my brother in Christ, Pastor Sandy Cancino. Finally, uh, we have Pastor Gilbert Durán from Nuevitas in Camagüey province. He is one of the many pastors leading uh, one of hundreds of churches that have uh, not been legally recognized. Okay. Ahí de la demolición del templo del apóstol Bernardo de Quesada en Camagüey, el que nos dirige la cobertura, el, eso fue el 8 de enero del 2016. Nosotros, eh, la forma que encontramos de expresar nuestro dolor fue a través de algunos letreros que colocamos en nuestra propiedad. Uno decía si el gobierno cubano viola los derechos de la iglesia. Al día siguiente yo salgo para Camagüey, dejando a mi mujer eh, sola con un niño. Salgo a apoyar en Camagüey, a estar con el apóstol, preocuparme por la situación. Y cuando regreso me encuentro a los niños solos en la calle, descalzo, el varón sin camisa. Y eh, los vecinos entonces eh, me cuentan la situación que eh, la seguridad del Estado penetró en mi propiedad. Eh, violentamente eh, ultrajaron a mi esposa, la insultaron con cosas muy fuertes delante de los niños toda esta situación, arrancaron violentamente los letreros y se la llevaron detenida eh, lo que me tocó fue eh, tomarlos conmigo y así mismo, bueno, no, no traía ni llave de la casa, así mismo fui directo a la Seguridad de Estado a ver la situación de mi esposa. Yo opino que a mí no me dieron golpe porque creo que los niños estaban allí y, y más la, la, el pueblo empezó a mirar, a curiosear y yo solo estaba pidiendo saber de mi esposa. Ok, thanks. Eh, was only three videos eh, as examples to the leaders, evangelical and catholics because the violations are against the all uh, religions. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank you, Mario Felix, for the great testimonials. It's impressive, really, how the Cuban government treats religious activists like common criminals and divides the faith community by treating them as troublemakers. Um, I, uh, we are running past the, uh, the time that we were uh, scheduled, uh, we're disrespecting some of your time. So if you, uh, if you need to leave, uh, go ahead. We won't be insulted, we're, but we do wanted to give a little bit of time for questions and answers, perhaps a couple of questions that were, uh, uh, that were out there and, uh, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, dismiss uh, all of you. So we'll ask Mari Carmen Estrada, who is our OAA TV personality, uh, we'll now uh, please to manage uh, uh, any uh, of the questions that were in the chat box. 
uh, there's still, uh, and, and if you have any other questions, please uh, add them quickly, type them quickly in the chat box so Mari Carmen can, uh, can, uh, can grab them. Mari Carmen? Yes, thank you, Dr. Babin. Uh, we are delighted to have heard so many good presentations, amazing information with highlights and key critical issues, both in Nicaragua and Cuba. We have received some questions, not in the chat box, but I think we're going to, well, welcoming you to write in the chat box if you have questions. Uh, for the moment, we have one for Irela, uh, talking about Nicaragua. And how do you see this question says about uh, the religious community in Nicaragua's election next year? How did, how did you envision the role of the religious community? Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, well, elections uh, 2021 in Nicaragua are crucial in terms of moving forward to end dictatorship in Nicaragua and to move forward into a more democratic society. And uh, well, we believe, and by we, I mean OAA, this is not just my opinion, it's something that we have discussed as a team. Um, we believe that integrating the faith community in the electoral pro process makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Almost all Nicaraguans describe themselves as having spiritual faith and 90% are members of Christian churches. This gives Nicaraguan churches and faith leader tremendous influence on congregation and communities. And uh, we believe that properly informed faith leaders can play a significant role uh, by promoting civic and voter responsibility, promoting awareness of important social and economic issues, uh, by providing information and political candidates candidates in their platforms or even maybe uh, for electoral observation. Um, although faith communities in some countries might uh, differ from engaging in political process, Nicaragua's church, as we saw uh, through our presentation, Nicaragua's churches find themselves already involved and we have a vest interest in restoring uh, democracy and constitutional uh, protection for human rights, including religious freedom. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Irela. Uh, we have another question here that is more related into Cuba and is very specific. I think uh, this will go to our CSW, CSW officer. And it has to do with all the violations and, and the repression that religious activists are going through in Cuba. And it says that are there any attorneys in Cuba who can help these religious activists with the violations of freedom of religion and belief or how can they go about it? Do you so, hear me? Oh, hello? Oh, go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I was just about to answer. Um, so one of the difficulties um, we found is that it's very, there are no real um, means of challenging um, through legal um, uh, through legal pathways um, a cr let's say a charge that is brought against you so some of the cases we've seen more recently um, where criminal charges of disobedience have been leveled against um, activists um, because the, ch the charge has not even formally been um, yet taken um, to the Ministry of Justice. It also means that because it's not formally on um, in the records, it also cannot be formally um, counted. And some of the uh, involvement we have seen where activists who do know lawyers seek um, legal advice, um, the authorities have um, both targeted the activist and um, the lawyer that is um, assisting um, that that assists and is um, helping the uh, the victim of the violation in question. So I think one of the key ways actually uh, to continue advocating about this is uh, to raise awareness of these violations um, when we hear about them. Um, one of the things we know about the government of Cuba is that it absolutely um, uh, it, it vehemently dislikes attention being drawn um, that distracts from its public image of rule of law, a constitution that is in, in, in place, someone that has signed up to but not as, has not ratified um, international covenants 
protecting human rights. So, um, so one of the things we we always uh, we would recommend is for people to share and share share these stories uh, in their in their pr personal and professional and social media networks, but also at the um, institutional level to continue working with um, uh, advocating in multilateral fora like the Human Rights Council, um, the International Religious Freedom Alliance that's just been established as well. Um, we're waiting to see um, how that will develop um, and to, to keep um, raising, uh, raising these issues about Cuba um, specifically. Well, thank you so much, CSW, for the information. And we have a question that we have received here through the chat, and it's related. It's a follow-on question to Irela, and it has to do with the election, the elections, and the role of the faith of uh, groups. It says, "Do do you fear retaliation from the government of Nicaragua uh, related of?" Uh, of the participation of the faith groups as actors or observers in the process of the elections in Nicaragua. Uh, thank you uh, for submitting that question. Well, the as I mentioned, the the faith community uh, it's already uh, involved in the process of restoring democracy in Nicaragua as they've been taking action uh, in, in protecting the citizenship interest and also uh, raising their voice up against the repression that the government has been uh, uh, taking place in Nicaragua. Um, of course, there's a big fear, as we saw in, in during uh, my presentation, like many bishops have already left the country and so many other incidents that had happened. Of course, there is fear, but uh, we believe that with the proper uh, uh, conditions that maybe uh, the international community can push uh, for the government to, to, to create and uh, in Nicaragua, or we trust a lot in the international community uh, pressure that can make and also, um, the, the 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 pressure that is going inside from the civil society groups that are, are uh, taking uh, actions in moving forward to democracy in Nicaragua, we believe that the the community religion will be gladly to be part of this process. Uh, but of course, they would they have to be certain grants uh, for security for them. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, we have a follow uh, question that is. Uh, directed to Mario Felix, Pastor Mario Felix, and it's it's just to get more information from you and your opinion on how can other organizations can help the persecuted churches and advocates in Cuba. Um, yes, um, in the, the case uh, of the um, religious institutions, uh, your prayers are very important because uh, we believe in the power of prayers. And uh, when brothers uh, around the world, young in prayer, even the strong world falls and the mountains uh, move. Uh, but the most powerful sentence are even actions. Uh, and solidarity actions, complaints, pronouncements can be carried or by uh, any entity in the, in the world, uh, regardless of uh, whether the identity themselves and believers or non-believers then are very important uh, all the actions uh, uh, press uh, attention uh, because the repression in Cuba is in general uh, no no difference uh, Catholics institution evangelicals uh, and new groups religions is uh, general against all the faith in Cuba uh, the Communist Party is the principal responsible uh, for this repression, uh, the government, the office uh, to the religions uh, affairs, and um, you, uh, I, by intervention, uh, the um, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla, the minister to the foreign affairs against the faith. Then it's the government against the faith, and we need the, your prayers. Very important. It's, it is very important and all, all, also the just sharing the information 
that we have heard today with others, I think that's another way and, and, and that's something that you also mentioned is to advocate and, and promote. Uh, we have, I think, a last question because of the time. Uh, there is a lot of interest, but we just have, I think, time for one last question. And this one has more to do with what we're all living around the world right now, which is a pandemic of COVID-19. And it's, it's just to get your opinions on how you have noticed or not more or less repression during this COVID-19 pandemic, both in Nicaragua and in, in Cuba. Maybe Dr. Babun can take, uh, uh, can provide some comments about Cuba and we can start with Irela uh, in Nicaragua. What do you think about the repression if it's been more or less during this pandemic for the religious community? Uh, well, as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, that we received the testimony of Bishop Carlos Aviles uh, saying that the Catholic Church uh, created a plan of prevention and the, the government officials blocked the plan. And I don't know if you are aware, but the Nicaraguan government has taken any actions on this pandemic. I believe this is the only country that he has been uh, avoiding the, the prevention uh, measures that have been taken by other countries. And of course, this, um, this makes the situation worse for Nicaraguan people because we just came out from a political outbreak two years ago and the, the lack of democracy and poverty conditions are increasing after this pandemic. And uh, it's a uh, deteriorating the, the, the situation for, for the population. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Irela, for your comments. And, and Dr. Babin, what do you think it's now the repression level, have they increased or not in Cuba related to the pandemic for the religious groups? Well, this was uh, almost like a setup question, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. this morning I was privileged to have the Miami Herald Publish uh, an op-ed uh, that I just uh, wrote about this uh, specific uh, issue uh, that's taking place in Cuba right now, as as the Cuban government is taking advantage of the pandemic, while the world is looking the other way to literally increase the repression of uh, in the island. There are a number of examples. I'm, I won't take the time. I'll just uh, you know. Uh, I actually want you to read the open, right? So uh, if you go and uh, look at the, uh, the Miami Herald, would appreciate it too. If you look at Miami Herald and look at the opens for today, it is the, uh, uh, it has written, it's published in the Miami Herald and it specifically talks about all of the, uh, all of this, uh, all, of, all of this issue. Um, I just want, I want to, I want you, uh, I want again, thank you for joining us today. I, please join me in thanking all the speakers for providing tremendous amount of information in such a short period of time. Uh, there's no question that I think that they have made a compelling argument to justify the listing of Nicaragua and Cuba in the user's uh, list of the world's worst violators of religious freedom. Uh, freedom of religion is intrinsic to social good and like freedom of expression and assembly is central to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, but these essential liberties, as well as the development of a truly independent civil society, are restricted by governments that fear upheaval, legitimate reform, and a loss of power, as do Cuba and Nicaragua. I hope that you found the webinar to be informative and thought-provoking. Um, to hear, if you want to hear those, the videos that were presented or even listen to the entire uh, conference again, uh, you're welcome. We're going to post the videos uh, and the conference in the uh, YouTube channel of Outreach Aid to the Americas. Just go to YouTube Outreach Aid to the Americas and you'll see and you'll be able to hear those videos uh, specifically, particularly uh, many of you were disappointed that you couldn't hear uh, the bishop from Nicaragua uh, speak, but uh, that'll be uh, uh, online uh, uh, just a few minutes. Uh, so on behalf of Outreach Aid to the Americas, Instituto Padmos, 
uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide and the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. We wish to thank you for attending and have a good afternoon. Thank you so very, very much. Bye. Thank you very much.